Okay, good morning. Welcome to Math 261 at Delta College. This is Tuesday, September 2nd, our class session. And today we get to do more math and less orientation, which will be the case every day. Every day we'll do more math and less orientation. We got to get oriented here at the beginning. So just some basic things that you've brought to my attention and we'll work them out as we go. If you're having any issues joining the Zoom meeting, please let me know, but I'll assume that you're following the link I provided on my website since you're here. And if you have to do something in another way, or if you're having issues joining that, please let me know. Uh, I am recording and posting these sessions on the YouTube channel. So I see that my recording went up on my webpage yesterday. So it may not have gotten posted to my section or playlist yet, but just to show you where these things are, share screen browser, So we're looking at week one in Math 261 right here. And we can blow that up a little bit to make it more useful. So our outline, recommended problems. But I assume that you entered this Zoom session from our homepage by clicking on this link Thursday here. I've had a couple of people popping into office hours that are Zoom office hours, as you're welcome to do. And you can use these links here on this page. I had one person bringing an issue to me with one of these links, and I haven't identified if there's an error or not yet, but if you try to follow these links to a Zoom meeting and they're not cooperating, just send me an email. That's our homepage, back to week one. Let's look at video. So here's a post to the recording of the session on Tuesday. And not gonna play the session here. I'll just halt it right there. But I collect those videos, hopefully in a playlist and the playlist gets put into my section. Right now, I don't see that happening. Here's some recommended problems. Here's some topics. I expect the class session playlist to show up right here too on my channel. Well, I'll investigate why that's not happening, but even if it's not here directly in this section, Math 261 Calculus 3, you do have a link to it directly from the website. Remember under resources, you have a link to everything that is posted. So that would include all videos of all sessions as they occur and they're recorded and posted. Uh, other things that happened that were interesting, someone asked a nice question about 2.2 number 119. And uh, that's a really good problem. So I enjoyed making a short video of that problem. I highly recommend you watch that video because it shows you an effective use of the word direction again. Direction is a really important word. Maybe we presented it to you yesterday in a way you hadn't thought of direction. Direction is pointing in vector land, the direction of a vector is its vector divided by its magnitude. And that sounds like abstract and unuseful, but actually it's powerfully useful. And this problem two, two number 119 allowed us to demonstrate that. This is our resources page. I'm gonna go back to our week one page to show you some other videos I recommend you watch. So, that 22119 is a really good video. Thank you for that question. And, and that's how we fill things in with your questions. 
There's two other videos I'm going to direct your attention to that you really should watch along with this lecture. And I'll refer to them, but I'm not going to prove them exactly. You know, mathematics is based on assertions and proofs. It's not true unless we can prove it. But I'm not using our time in here to prove everything is true. Sometimes I'll just leave that off to the side. So there's two famous inequalities we must have to make sure this is all working. And they're called the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality and the triangle inequality. Maybe you've heard of the triangle inequality before, but the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality and the triangle inequality here, I'm going to refer to these things as being true in any dimension. Triangle inequality in plain English says the shortest distance between two points is a line. And I'll illustrate that for you. You could say it another way. Uh, the sum of any two sides of a triangle must be longer than the remaining side, must be no shorter than the remaining side at least. It could theoretically be equal if you have a kind of a degenerate triangle. But these are geometry facts. That's a powerful geometry fact that you're used to dealing with two and three dimensional space, the triangle inequality. But in fact, the triangle inequality holds in any size space where we define these vectors and operations that we're doing yesterday and today. And so the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality is a key to expressing the triangle inequality in any dimensions. It basically means that we're gonna validate the idea of angle and distance in any dimension. So definitely watch those two videos, maybe a little bit longer than the standard three minutes. I, I um, uh, pop up the triangle inequality video. Okay, that was five minutes. The Cauchy Schwartz inequality video. That's nine minutes. Well, it's nine minutes because it's really important. Okay, so just orienting you to some things right there. Now, some other handouts we're talking about that might help you today dot product consequences, distance or intersection, and then some other fun distance problems. We'll get into more of those later, but we're going to talk about the dot product today. And so this dot product consequences handout might be useful to you. Okay, next up, you've already begun submitting homework, so thank you very much. This was the homework that is due tonight by 11.59. If you submit it early, I don't mind, as long as you're comfortable with your solution, but you have two more problems to do. They will be due one week from today at 11.59, and they're posted right here. Remember, we have no class session on Tuesday, September 7, because that's Delta College's Labor Day break. Okay, very good. So then let's get back to work. So I want you to see videos for problem 2.2, number 119. And I want you to see the video for the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. And the triangle inequality. Kind of running out of space right there. Let me go back to my paper. And again, while you're watching my browser, on the screen right now, if I'm sharing that screen with you, you can have access to any of the windows I'm presenting, whiteboard, paper, browser. But for the sake of the recording, the thing that I focus on is the thing that's recorded. So right now, my browser is being recorded, and my paper is not being recorded. If I go out of that sharing, and I'm going to automatically go back to my paper because I've set the paper as the thing that's pinned in Zoom language. 
So see these three videos, keep your questions coming if you want to ask some more questions. So we're focusing today on more vectors. We're going to talk about the dot product. We're going to talk about projection. And we're going to do some more talk about direction. And the so-called direction cosines. As things go, as we have time, we might talk about some simple objects in space, but very simple. Lines, planes. Circles, spheres. Maybe even some cylinders. Cylinders would be the most mysterious thing we talk about here. I emphasize the word simple because we may not be ready to discuss these things in full generality, but I want to show you that you already have access to these objects, even though we've only begun looking at things in space. Okay, so let me get a couple different colors here so I can work with them. Got it. So the most important thing I want you to focus on is the thing that we ended with last time. We have vectors in two dimensions or three dimensions. And notice when I put two arrows on the page like this, if I scan this paper later, the red and green will show up better than it might show up on your camera right now, but I have these in two different colors. If I have two vectors here, let's call this vector U. Let's call this vector V. Just writing this on the paper, I don't want you to have any prejudice whether these are two dimensions or three dimensions. You could pretend these are three dimensional vectors that I've represented on a piece of paper. They could be higher dimensional vectors, but that's not the thing we're gonna focus on in this class. So the most important thing you can do with two vectors is add or subtract them. And so we presented the parallelogram law. which literally means you can add two vectors by just setting the tail of one vector on the head of the other. Excuse me, I'll keep my color coding. That's the vector U right here. So in this picture, you see that if I put the V at the end of U, or if I put U at the end of V, I get the same result. I land at the same point. And I have a natural starting point and a natural ending point. And I call that vector u plus v. OK, that's not earth shattering. You've probably done that before. The thing that I want to focus on was the other diagonal in this parallelogram. I can draw a line segment across these two opposite vertices, or I can draw a line segment across these two opposite vertices. And this is more than a line segment, it also represents an important vector. But remember, it's not a vector until I indicate direction. A vector is a directed line segment. Right now I just have a line segment. So now I indicate a direction, and I want to discover what this vector is, because I don't know what it is. You know, for the sake of argument, let's call it W for a second. And you know what I'm about to say, you know, W is U minus V, or is it V minus U, right? Everybody gets that mixed up. I wanna make sure you never get it mixed up. 
So if I'm looking at this diagram, and, and sometimes I have to redraw the diagram to know which way the arrow is going, right? But if I look at this diagram, what I see is that u is equal to v plus w. And I'm going to stop color coding here because that is a little bit time consuming. And then the moment I write that, I've answered my question. Is W U minus V or is W V minus U? Well, just by writing this, U is equal to V plus W, I've answered the question. By subtracting V from both sides, I get W is U minus V. Okay. So make sure you know how to identify both of the diagonals on a parallelogram like this. So there's no more mystery right here. W is U minus V. These are geometric representations of variables, of uh, vectors, excuse me. And I emphasize again, this is dimension agnostic. Agnostic uh, in a common sense means neutral or I don't care. I don't care is not a very good way to say it. I don't favor one or the other. Geometric representations, these are dimension agnostic. And that is, I could be talking about two, three or 10 dimensional vectors in this picture. The truth that I'm saying has nothing to do with the dimensions. Okay, good. So what can we do with vectors? Apparently, we can add them, we can subtract them. But we also talked another operation yes, uh, Tuesday, we can scale them. Scaling them is to say, oh, here's the vector V. Excuse me, I gotta move my papers up and down here. I gotta get back in the habit of doing that. And then here's a vector that's V and then V again. So this vector from here to here looks exactly like what I'm about to call it. It's two V. Or I could take a vector that is half as long and goes in the opposite direction. And I call that vector minus one half V. The number in front the two, the number in front the minus one half is called a scalar. I mean, I could say that V is equal to one V if you like. So I can add, subtract, and scaling is just a fancy way of saying stretch or shrink, but I'm not gonna tell you which. You can scale by two, you can scale by minus one half. Scaling is stretching or shrinking, or in this context, changing the direction. So I can stretch or shrink, or I can change the direction. I have for every vector, a length, and a direction. which we defined to be the vector divided by its magnitude. In the geometric sense, the length is something that I measure with a measuring device. But I also have an algebraic description of vectors, which gave me an easy way to calculate length. So if vector is v1, v2, or vector is v1, v2, v3. And by v1, v2 in pointy brackets, I mean simply wherever you're standing, you take v1 steps in one specified direction, horizontal, and v2 steps in another specified direction, vertical. Or, 
if I was talking about three dimensions, V1 steps in the X direction, V2 steps in the Y direction, V3 steps in the Z direction. But I wanna be really careful with you because who defined horizontal and vertical? Who defined X, Y, and Z, right? So sometimes you get into these questions in mathematics, like going down a rabbit hole and you're always chasing these words. After you define one thing in terms of one word, then you bring up other words that you have to define. I'm not gonna worry about that right now because in the end, the mathematician's gonna pull out this thing. Well, I'm going to set up some base definitions and mathematics base definitions are often called axioms. But it turns out that the truth I'm describing to you in all these geometric and algebraic representations is true regardless of dimension and true regardless of any legitimate frame of reference. I don't have to think about only X and Y if I go back to your algebra days. I don't have to think about only horizontal and vertical. So these things, the V1, V2, the V2, V3, V1, V2, V3, these are called the coordinates of the vector. And that's already an abstraction. The coordinates of the vector are just the ways of describing the vector in any legitimate frame of reference. Before we get into what a legitimate frame of reference is, for right now, you could just take them as horizontal and vertical and X, Y, and Z coordinates. So in the algebraic sense, we define length, two-dimensional vector, to be the square root of v1 squared plus v2 squared, which you commonly call the Pythagorean theorem. That is mag v is equal to v1 squared, mag v squared is equal to v1 squared plus v2 squared, or three dimensions, mag v is equal to the square root of v1 squared plus v2 squared plus v3 squared, which can also be written mag v squared is equal to v1 squared plus v2 squared plus v3 squared. It turns out I want both representations with and without the square root, and you'll see why shortly. But if it seems like too painstaking to say these things, because you may have already taken these things for granted. If it seems too painstaking to say these things, then be careful because I'm gonna open a door in a few minutes that we can walk through and you could be very disoriented unless you remember these basic facts but these basic facts don't have to describe the universe you're used to. They will describe many universes. Okay, so this is a quick representation of what we did last time in a sense. Uh, I will say to you that every vector, no matter where we're talking about, has both a length and direction. But since you know, famous never say never, there's an exception to every rule. Remember the zero vector can legitimately be describing a length. The zero vector is zero units long. The zero vector must be the vector that goes nowhere. The vector that's filled with zeros in all slots or the vector that's simply a dot on your paper. So every vector in the universe has a length and direction. Every vector in the universe is the product of its length and its direction. And just so we allow this one exception, there's one vector that has no direction and that is the zero vector. Well, it has no direction, 
because algebraically, we're not allowed to divide by zero. Geometrically, I can't see where it's going. Okay, so that exception doesn't throw you. That exception doesn't like bother you seriously. It's just a unique element. We could call zero the center of the universe. Okay, so now if you allow me the things that I've written on this paper, let me share a page in the book with you. It's page 112. And so I'm gonna do this to help you get oriented. Remember, when we're looking at a browser on our syllabus, I directed you to our book. And you could have a hardback, paperback, or digital copy. You could have a PDF copy of the book and open the PDF copy on your device, phone, tablet, computer. But they also have a live version of this book online that I link you to right here. So you can consume the book here and it's kind of, it's not bad consuming the book here because you get to link to all the, you know, you get all the values of the hyperlinks right here. So I'm gonna look at page 112 in your book to a very important list of rules. Mm -hmm. right, except the problem is here, when I'm looking at this, yeah, you gotta excuse me. The downside is they do not orient you with the page numbers, which kind of makes sense, but it's kind of distracting as well. I don't want to be in section 2-1. They just orient you by section. I want to be in section, I don't want to be in section 2-2, I want to be in section 2-1. This is the downside of doing the book in this format. Page numbers, indices, indexes in the back of the book. They're powerful ways of orienting you. Hyperlinks can be very disorienting. This is the table I want to look at. So if you've accepted everything I've said so far, then it's not difficult to show you that these animals that I call vectors whether I describe them geometrically or algebraically, must satisfy these eight properties. I could specify more, but I'll start with these eight. These are called the properties of vector operations. And I'll just not prove them for you. Right now, I'm just gonna appeal to your common sense. And that is, I've already shown you geometrically on the paper, that if you add V, to the end of u, or if you add u to the end of v, you get the same vector u plus v. So that's commutative. If you add three vectors, it doesn't matter which ones you add first, that's associative. Why am I bringing these rules? Why is the author bringing these rules? Because you have this very powerful math machine built up in your mind, but it depends on assumptions you've already made. One of your famous assumptions is two times three is three times two, right? Or two plus five is five plus two. What I'm telling you with these rules right here is that it's okay to use those assumptions on vectors and to a point. Okay, so we have commutativity, we have associativity. Here's another one that you're very hooked on in algebra and arithmetic, five plus zero is five. Well, there's the same thing for vectors. The vector u plus the zero vector, notice he doesn't put a hat on this, but we're talking about vectors, is equal to the vector u. In other words, the vector zero vector doesn't change any vector when you add it to that. Uh, in arithmetic, you're used to five plus minus five is the number zero. Here, u plus minus u is the vector zero. This fifth law right here is called associativity of scalar multiplication. It says if you scale a vector and then scale that result, you would get the same thing as if you multiply the two scalars and then scale the vector. 
So you are free to apply scalars in that fashion. Six is another rule after that logic. If you add two numbers and then scale a vector with the result, it would be the same as if you scaled the vector individually with those two numbers and then added them. That's a powerful weapon in your arithmetic and algebra, distributive, distributive property. Here's another distributive property. If you add two vectors and then scale them, it would be the same as if you scaled the vectors individually and then added them. Notice that property six and seven are different properties. And sometimes people would make these two properties, the author makes them one. If you multiply the scalar one times any vector, you will not change it. But if you multiply the scalar zero times any vector, you will create the zero vector. And here's another awkwardness of his language here, but was just gonna to have to live with it. Do you notice that when he says zero u equals zero, well, the zero on the right side is the zero vector and the zero on the left side is the number zero. So back to my paper, I would have much rather him write that as zero the number times any vector is equal to zero the vector. And you've got to absorb the difference. And I'm sorry that you have to absorb the difference like that, but this is not the only person who can be casual with their language. I also pointed out to you in 22119, by the way, that the answer in the back of the book is exactly opposite the answer that you should get. And so maybe that's why someone was asking the question too. I have a great deal of respect for this book and its authors but it could have benefited by some proofreading. So if you see something printed in an exercise, a presentation, or an answer that doesn't make sense to you, do not assume that you don't understand. Ask me about it and we'll straighten it out. Okay, so these are really, really important things. I'm gonna say one more thing about consequences of these representations I wrote on the paper. So let me go back to my paper. Oh, okay, good. Thank you very much. Uh, and people come and go. I, I see the note from the chat from some of the people who are at a different site. People come and go, that's not a problem. You can just check the recordings later. <coughs> so let's go back to my paper. Excuse me. Stop sharing screen. Got it. Back to paper. Excuse me. There we go. And let me show you some other consequences of these things right here. So you are used to, I'll keep these algebraic representations on the board. You're used to me saying, the magnitude is equal to the square root of the sum of the squares in the context of a right triangle. So if I say vector is v1, v2, then you think of this statement, v1 squared plus v2 squared square rooted, or mag v1 squared equals v1 squared plus v2 squared, you think of that as the Pythagorean theorem. And it looks something like this. Here's a V vector. And here's a right triangle with one side length V1 and one side length V2. Be very careful when you read this drawing I just made. One of these things, the hypotenuse, is a vector. These other two things, v1 and v2, are scalars. They're numbers. I did not give them vector hats because I just want them to be numbers. For example, if I had v1 and v2, 
B five and two. Then no one would be confused if I asked them for the length of B. So B squared is five squared plus two squared square rooted. It's square root of 29. But it's really important to notice this. I can do exactly the same thing in three dimensions. And I'm not teaching you drawing, but I want you to imitate drawings, right? So let's say that I gently sketched in some X, Y, and Z axis here, lightly. so that it doesn't disrupt what I'm gonna add. And then I took a distance, V1 on the x-axis. Often I have the paper oriented so that the axis coming out of the paper is the x-axis. And the two axes in the paper are the y-axis and the z-axis. You can orient these any way you want. The physicists sometimes tend to put the z-axis coming out of the paper and leave the x and y-axis in the plane. But I oriented by the right-hand rule, which again is described in the book. And then I have another distance over here called V2. And then I have a third distance. On top of that, called B3. And this vector V1, V2, V3 goes V1 in the first coordinate, V2 in the second coordinate, and V3 in the third coordinate. That's how it creates this vector right here. But I want to make it very clear that I'm still using the Pythagorean theorem. Because this vector, if I cast its shadow on the xy plane, creates a right triangle. And the right triangle has sides v1 and v2. So what is the distance of this shadow b? We'll talk more about shadows later. Well, b squared is v1 squared plus v2 squared. And if I asked you for the length of this v, just by the Pythagorean theorem, this v, b and v sound alike, so I apologize for that. Now I have a right triangle vertically oriented in space, you know, standing up on the desk. I have two right triangles here, visualize two right triangles here. And the right triangle that's standing up has sides b, and V3. So the length of V is what? By the Pythagorean theorem in this two dimensional right triangle, B squared plus V3 squared. Well, now you see that if you put these together, excuse me, I'll move my paper up. V1 plus V2, V1 squared plus V2 squared is B squared b squared plus v3 squared is mag v squared. So mag v squared apparently is v1 squared plus v2 squared plus v3 squared. So you could think of this statement right here as the Pythagorean theorem in space or the Pythagorean theorem three dimensions. Now that's not a ordinary way that people refer to it. They keep it in two dimensions because they want to respect the original object. But you could think of this literally as a Pythagorean theorem in three dimensions. Out over up. And this action of going out over up or one coordinate, second coordinate, third coordinate creates two right triangles. And the two right triangles justify 
my definition of length in space. So often I'll just say the Pythagorean theorem generally applies to two dimensions. It applies to three dimensions. And then if we were going to investigate this further, I could make such an argument in any dimension, I could say Pythagorean theorem applies everywhere. Okay, before, and you know, come up to the top of the hour, we're gonna take a break. Before we take a break, I wanna show you some other simple geometric objects in the plane or in space. So what I'm trying to do is extend your familiarity with geometry in the plane. In fact, you might have even taken a class one day called geometry, where you discussed all the truths of geometry in the plane. I want to show you that all those truths extend also to higher dimensions. So I'm just labeling the paper. Let me give you a really simple example. So when I say to you in one dimension, here's a number line, and I say to you x equals two, in the context of one dimension, you know what I mean. I mean that dot on the number line at the point that's labeled two. You could say that dot that is two units to the right of the origin, or that dot that is two units to the right of zero. But you also know that if I said x equals two to you, and the context was the plane, I mean something else entirely. If I say x equals two to you in the context of the plane, I mean all those dots that have an x coordinate of two. And I don't have time to fill in all the dots. Well, I guess I do, I'll draw a line. Okay, so this is x equals two in two dimensions. In one dimension, x equals two is a point. In two dimensions, x equals two is a line. And you don't have any confusion like, Oh, these are different things. No, these are different contexts. So now let's talk about three dimensions. And you can probably guess what I'm going to say then. If I talk to you about x equals two in the context of space, you would look at your x, y, and z axes. And you would mark all the points where x is equal to two. You have a scale on the x-axis, let's scale that scale right there. One, two, three, four, there's two. There's a point, two, zero, zero, whose x-coordinate is two. But you know that there are many, many, many points whose x coordinate is two. They could be all these points that I just drew a second ago in the x, y plane. Or they could be points going up and down this elevator parallel to the z axis. In fact, I have a whole wall of points where x equals two and I represent them by like a sheet of paper. Now, in fact, this is an infinite sheet of paper, but I don't have time to draw the infinite sheet of paper. This is a plane. This is the plane x equals two. This is the line x equals two. This is the point x equals two. Okay, so if you're willing to accept all these things, you can describe lots of sheets of paper. Here's the plane y equals three. 
So I marked three steps on the y-axis. Of course, this drawing is going to get very busy, and I apologize for that. I can go sliding up and down the x-axis. I can go sliding up and down the z-axis. Now, this plane right here would be what? Kind of oriented coming out of the paper at you. So again, this is where I'm going to have to apply to some drawing magic or drawing skills. Here's the plane, y equals three in green. Now I want to make sure you understand the difference in these two words, x equals two and y equals three or x equals two or y equals three. Let's look at these two words in the context of space, in the context of three dimensions. If I demand from you all the points where x is two and y is three, then what I'm demanding from you is all the points that live on the red sheet of paper and the green sheet of paper. That would be the intersection of the two sheets, which is itself logically a line But what line is it? Well, right now I'm at a loss. I can only say it's the line L where X equals two and Y equals three. And that's a fine description, but what happens if the line is tilted or banked or you know at some angle? I'm gonna to have to come up with a different way of doing lines. But if I say to you, I want all the points where X equals two or y equals three, that's much, much more permissive. This is the union of two planes. So be very careful whether you use the word and or or, and everybody uses and and or too casually, including me, including professionals. So just when the moment comes that this seriously matters, make sure you use the words and and or carefully. And means what they share, means intersection, which here is a vertical line. See, I even gotta be careful when I say vertical. Well, what does vertical mean in the context of the plane? Vertical means one thing. In the context of space, vertical means something else. And I'm just used to using vertical in a casual way, up and down. Here, it's the line parallel to the z-axis specified by x equals two and y equals three. And here, the union of two planes, it's these two pages of the book, the red page and the green page of the book. You know that if I drew a plane z equals four, I could draw a plane that's kind of like, oh, I don't want to do this because it's going to make this drawing too much, but in the context of you see me draw it. It's not too bad. Here's the plane z equals four. What is the plane z equals four? It's kind of like the tabletop. It's parallel to what? It's parallel to the x, y plane. And you see now naturally, if I said, I want the animal where x is two and y is three and z is four. Well, that's a very special animal. There's only one animal in space. It has an X coordinate of two, a Y coordinate of three, and a Z coordinate of four. And that is what? This point, two, three, four. As I draw the thing, any one thing I draw is not too busy, but now that I've got the whole thing drawn, it's a mess. I understand it's a mess. So do you see, here's an interesting truth. How do I describe the point P on the line? Oh, very simple. Just one piece of information. How do I describe a point P in the plane? Two pieces of information. But when I add dimensions, when I add excess access to other dimensions, then to specify something as simple as a point requires three pieces of information. Okay, so very good. Thank you. You've been organized there. Uh, I'll just... 
say a couple other things before we take a break. I could specify a sphere by saying x squared plus y squared plus z squared is two squared. And by your knowledge of the distance formula, what does that represent? It represents all the points in the universe that are two units away from the origin. But again, I fall into this trap that now I'm trying to draw something three-dimensional on a two-dimensional surface. So it kind of looks like a sphere, but it's not perfect. If I define a sphere, I can change its center by resetting the center on the X, Y, and Z. So if I say X minus two squared, Y minus three squared, Z minus four squared equals two squared. Then now I'm talking about the sphere that is centered at two, three, and four, which I'm only casually drawing, the point two, three, and four that we marked above. And now I do a radius. I go in any of the three directions, any direction I want, two units, that creates the same size sphere, but now it's moved to a different place. Now, spheres can interact the same way planes can interact. Two planes can interact to form a line. Do you observe that two spheres can interact to form a circle? So if you imagine that these were bubbles that could cross over each other, although soap bubbles don't behave in that way, you would imagine these two permeable soap bubbles, ping pong balls, that they do share a set of points. And the set of points they share would be a circle. And although that sounds obvious, that's not necessarily simple to demonstrate, right? But it's the only way those two spheres could interact. How can two spheres interact? They could be the same sphere. They could never touch. They could touch in a point, but if they touch more than a point and they're not the same, they actually have to touch in a circle. Okay, one more, and then we're gonna take a break. I apologize for that. I probably, you're gonna discover, have a bad habit of saying one more. Let's look at this object. What if I said to you, x squared plus y squared equals two squared? Only x squared plus y squared, but I say we're in the context of space. So here's a really important truth to learn. So you are thinking of this as a circle of radius two. It is a circle of radius two in the plane. In what plane? In the x and y plane, because this equation constrains x and y. So if we were only living in the plane, if you and I were only two dimensional animals, that's the circle. But what is this object in three dimensions? And I say there's a natural interpretation. And here's the natural interpretation. Uh, there's no constraints on Z. So Z can be anything I want. I could draw this circle at height Z equals one. I could draw this circle at height Z equals minus two. And I can't draw two circles to be the same to save my life. But if you think about this for a while, I could draw a circle at any height I please. And what have I drawn? A toilet paper roll. Well, the cardboard roll. Now this goes on forever again, but I can't draw forever. So I'm just drawing a portion of the cardboard roll at the center of a roll of toilet paper. Well, it has a more common word in mathematics called cylinder. But I want to be very careful before I let you go on the break. Cylinder in mathematics means many things. This is a right circular cylinder. That means it's a circle. I'm sorry, it's a cylinder made out of right circles. 
Well, it's a cylinder made out of circles and the circles are at right angles to this plane. But I could instead look at this equation, y equals x squared. Let's say this is the x-axis, y-axis. And you know y equals x squared to be a parabola. And if I gave you this to draw in the plane, you'd have no problem. If I give you this to draw in three dimensions, then you got to think of your plane as a tabletop. So here comes the parabola coming out here, coming out here. This is only a portion of that parabola y equals x squared. But now let's think of it in three dimensions where z can be anything. And then again, what I end up doing is drawing all kinds of parabolas at different heights, which again, I cannot reproduce to save my life. But what am I creating right here? I'm creating a sheet of paper that's been kind of bent and I don't know what I could do imitate that in front of you because the camera I have so limited range I should step out in front of my camera there but it's a little bit like taking a post-it note and bending it into a parabola shape and letting that slide up and down you know this is a cylinder too but this cylinder is made out of parabolas it's called a parabolic cylinder Okay, that's what I want to do. Now we're going to take a break. I wanted you to understand you still have this word cylinder, but cylinder is now going to be expanded. You have a parabolic cylinder, a right circular cylinder, an elliptic cylinder, a hyperbolic cylinder. In fact, cylinder can be any curve in the plane that you, the fancy word is extrude or slide up and down in space. Now my drawing is really bad. This is just a wavy cylinder. Okay, let's take five. I'm gonna come back at 906 and then we'll go on. I was trying to give you some geometric grounding in space. I'm gonna mute my microphone and stretch my legs. You could do the same and then we'll get back to some other things. If you have any questions, by the way, you throw them in the chat, I'll um, get to them as we go.
Okay, we're coming back. It's 9.06. Uh, as time goes on, and you probably experienced this over the past year, it's a little bit awkward to communicate when some people are listening to you directly, some people are going to listen to you six hours from now, or something like that. It's a little bit like being on Mars or something. They don't get your transmission for another 15 minutes or longer time if you were farther away. But we were just trying to establish some simple geometric truths that you can carry into three dimensions. Do you see what a cylinder is? A cylinder is something where you've specified X and Y, but then you let Z roam up and down as long as you keep the same relationship in X and Y. So a cylinder, you could call a two-dimensional object. Why is that? Because one dimension is free and two dimensions are constrained. A plane is a two-dimensional object, but here two dimensions are free. If I say the plane Y equals three, then X and Z can be anything I want, but I'm constraining Y. So you can sometimes think of extending objects to higher dimensions in that sense. That's exactly what people do. Okay, so now what is the next step we're gonna take? So vectors. We can add, we can subtract, we can scale, we can measure length, We can observe direction. And now we want to know what else we can do. So vectors are a way of describing where things are in space so far. But can vectors describe the relationships between things? So here's a natural question. Can we multiply vectors? I mean, it's a little bit like how you deal with real numbers, right? You can add four and five, you can subtract four and five, you can double four or double five. You can also multiply four and five. Four times five is 20. You multiply four and five and you get another number called 20. Vectors are made out of numbers. So it's not an unnatural question to ask, can we multiply vectors? And in true ambiguous mathematics spirit, we're going to say yes and no. I'm only saying that in a humorous sense. Well, we can multiply vectors. In fact, we can multiply vectors and be very, very satisfied and excited with the results but it may not be the multiplication you expect. You've had a physics course, possibly. You've had other courses, possibly. You've heard the word dot product and cross product, possibly. If you haven't, we're about to define them for you now in section 2.3 and 2.4. So the dot product and the cross product are ways of multiplying vectors. And they're extremely powerful. We're only talking about the dot product here in section 2.3. But it might not be multiplication in the sense that you expect it to be. And there we have to be very, very careful. And at first that looks like a burden, but in the end, it's going to be a freedom, a powerful tool. So first I'm going to define what a dot product is. And uh, if you've seen it before, that's okay. But then we can talk about how it looks like multiplication, how it doesn't look like multiplication. And then what good does it do us? 
what good does it do us? So let's say I have a vector v1. Well, let's say I have a vector u and v. Sometimes if I use subscripts for coordinates, then I can't use subscripts for different vectors, right? So let's, for the moment, use subscripts for coordinates and whole letters for the things. And remember, when I don't put an arrow hat on it, it's a number, which would be really, really, really confusing unless I put an arrow hat on these. So try to follow these conventions naturally. Uh, if you like, I could have said u is v1, u2, v3, and v, I'm sorry, u is u1, u2, u3, it would be confusing if I use the v's, and v is v1, v2, v3. And so now I'm going to define the dot product of u and v. And that is in two dimensions, u vector dot v vector is u1 v1 plus u2 v2. And in three dimensions, that product, u dot v is u1 v1 plus u2 v2 plus u3 v3. It's kind of a simple definition. It says, multiply the slots. Notice it does not say u1 v1 is creating a new vector. u dot v is creating a new vector u1 v1 comma u2 v2. It does not say I multiply the numbers in each slot and leave them there. And this is important. And it's the first major drawback of the dot product. But first of all, let's just practice doing one. So if u is minus one, two, three, excuse me, and v is 0, 4, negative 5, then u dot v is simply minus 1 times 0, 2 times 4, and 3 times minus 5. And generally, as you multiply these, you're not going to write down the six numbers. Uh, you could just say 0 plus 8 minus 15. Or when you get used to doing this, you say zero plus eight minus 15 is negative seven. So u dot v is negative seven. Now two things, gotta get over our disappointment, then we gotta tell you what that means. What is our disappointment? Well, remember when you multiply two numbers, you get a number back. Four times five is 20. But when I multiply two vectors in this way, I do not get a vector back. So I wanna make sure you don't think I'm only multiplying the slots. I am multiplying the slots and adding them together. And that violates a couple of your common sense rules. Like number one, who told you you were supposed to add them together? Why didn't you subtract them? Why didn't you multiply the slats and then multiply the results? So to, for me to say to you, multiply the slats and then add the results together, that seems totally crazy arbitrary. Like you're just making stuff up. So that's one of your objections. Second objection is you're used to multiplying two animals and getting one of those animals back. You multiply two complex numbers, you get a complex number back. You multiply two real numbers, you get a real number back. Here I am multiplying 
two vectors, but I'm not getting a vector back. I'm getting a number out instead. And for that reason, I didn't want to call this multiplying. Well, no, traditionally people call it a product. So if you're worried or if you're curious, like why didn't they call it dot multiply? Let's call it dot product because it's not exactly what you have traditionally thought of as multiplying. Okay, let's do something else. Well, instead of talking about where it fails, why don't we talk about where it succeeds? What if I had multiplied? Well, what if I had dotted? What if I had dot product v dot u? In other words, I want to convince you if I do u dot v or v dot u, you know, it literally doesn't make any difference if I switch the order of these numbers in here. Instead of minus one times zero, two times four, three times minus five, what if I did zero times minus one plus four times two plus minus five times three? Because it doesn't matter what order I multiply the numbers. It doesn't matter what order I take a dot product. Still minus seven. Well, that's comforting. That's comforting because four times five is five times four. So at least you're okay right there. So what do we got? We got something that looks a little bit like multiplying, but it's not exactly what we thought we meant by multiplying. It's called the dot product. Now let me show you the value of the dot product. And this gets into those two videos I need you to watch later called the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. and triangle inequality. And when I present something like that and say, oh, let's prove that this is true. I would not ask you to prove something that's true in that way. This is not a class where you're proving things. If you want to go out in mathematics, then you'll take the class where you do the things we're doing now, but you turn out and prove them but I provided these two videos for you where I proved the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality and the triangle inequality. I provided those two videos for you so that you know that things can be proved and that you can have absolute confidence in those two ideas. So after I show you what I'm about to show you and you watch these two uh, videos, then you'll have much more confidence, much more belief in the value of this thing called dot product. Let's try another dot product. How about u is uh, one three, v is, let's just slim down to two dimensions right now, um, four minus two, and w is, minus five and one. And let me draw those things on a clean coordinate axis. In fact, I think I wanna add another vector, U, V, W, C, but here, here's this, this curse of letters, right? The next letter would be X, but I use X for X coordinates and X axes. That's a trouble whenever you use letters, right? That's why people end up invariably using subscripts. But um, I don't know, let's you just use another, I like, can't use I, J, and K, I used those last time. See, people always get in trouble with naming vectors, even with letters. Let's name a vector Z called minus three and one. Okay, so now I'm gonna draw these vectors. And since I have relatively small numbers, clean grid right here, it's not hard to draw these. I draw over one and up three. That's the vector U. I draw over four and down two. No matter 
I have to have another vector anyway. That's the vector B. I draw, let me change W to positive five and one. That'll be a little more economical. I draw over five and up one. There's an old joke about math professors. When something's not gonna work out, they just go back and change the problem. You say, well, can I do that on the test? No, you can't. And then let's look at this vector Z called minus three and one. I try to draw this really, really carefully though. And that gives you almost the impression, you gotta be careful. Wow, Z is going in the opposite direction of V. No, it's not. V is going at a ratio of two to one. Z is going at a ratio of three to one, but even on the paper drawn carefully, they look similar. So are Z and V along the same line? No, they're not, but by your eye, it's not easy to tell. Okay, now let's execute some dot products. Let's do u dot w. And I'm just gonna execute them quickly. If you need to, you can check that I'm doing it correctly later, but so many numbers here, make sure you pick the right ones. One times five, three times one. Five plus three is eight. So u dot w is eight. What I'm about to say to you is, what does the eight mean? Okay, let's try u dot v. So here's u, here's v, they're next to each other, that's not bad. Four minus six, negative two. It's very easy to multiply these quickly, right? But it's also very easy to then make a mistake. So be careful when you're doing that. Now I want you to look at u and v and u and w really carefully. And now I'm gonna get bitten by the fact that I only drew this with my hand. But do you see that the angle between U and W is less than 90 degrees? And do you see that the angle between U and V, even though it's very slight, the angle between U and V is greater than 90 degrees. U dot W is eight. U dot V is minus six. Now I'm not gonna look at the size of the numbers yet, but now I can tell you a universal truth. When U dot W is positive number, that means the angle between those two vectors is less than 90 degrees. When U, excuse me, I slide this up. When U dot V, is less than zero, negative six. That means the angle between them is greater than 90 degrees. Now maybe you can sniff out what I'm about to say about U and Z. Let's do U and Z. U dot Z. Well, logically, let's think about this. If a positive number means the angle is less than 90, if a positive dot product means angle less than 90, if a negative dot product means angle greater than 90, then what would be between positive and negative? It would be dot product of zero. What's between less than 90 and greater than 90? 90. Let's do u dot z. Negative three plus three. Multiply the slots, add together. Negative three plus three is zero. And indeed, if you look at my drawing very carefully, over one, up three versus, when I say over one, I should be even careful, right? I should say right one, up three, left three, up one. To say over doesn't convince you that I'm going left or right. That is a right angle. So here's the first thing the dot product is famous for. The dot product is famous for telling you the size of the angle between two vectors. The dot product detects whether the angle is acute 
or obtuse, obtuse greater than 90, acute less than 90, or you know, I have to choose a different color. Here's a right angle. That's kind of useful. Why is that useful? Because I can't always depend that I can draw well. Of course, you can say, well, I draw better than you draw, Dave. So I don't have any trouble drawing vectors and telling what the angle between them is. Really? Could you draw these two vectors? You could draw those two vectors, uh, but you'd have to draw their shadows on a two-dimensional piece of paper, wouldn't you? But look at the dot product is minus seven. So I don't even have to draw it. I know that these two vectors have an angle that's what? Negative dot product bigger than 90 degrees. Now that's a little bit useful. Someone hands me two three-dimensional vectors. I can tell you whether they're separated by 90 degrees or more, 90 degrees or less, or whether they're exactly 90 degrees. Uh, you could use a right angle. If you have a dot product equal to zero, you're always okay to say U and Z are perpendicular. There's lots of words that people use for right angle. Perpendicular, sometimes people use the fancy word orthogonal. We will use that word sometimes, orthogonal. Means perpendicular, means at a right angle. So it's really easy to tell when two vectors form a right angle. I gotta get my fingers to form a right angle. It's, too, it's easy to say when two vectors are less than 90 degrees or more than 90 degrees. I just performed the dot product. Now that would probably be enough to satisfy a lot of people. Say, well, hey, that's cool. But what about that person who says, I wanna know exactly what the angle is, Dave. So how do we deal with a person who wants to know exactly what the angle is? I'm gonna step away from my desk for a second. I grab my protractor. Oh, excuse me, not trip over any cords in the process. Well, you have this device right here, right? This device will tell you exactly what the angle is between those two vectors. So what's the angle between U and V? Well, it's got some problems, doesn't it? I mean, I gotta line things up nicely. I gotta extend this line. It looks like that angle is 90 plus, Maybe I'm going to estimate, see, there's a problem, estimate 97 degrees. Is that 97 degrees about between U and V? Well, I really don't know, even though I'm measuring with a very nice device. I mean, I could measure always more and more accurate if I have more and more sophisticated devices, right? How about the angle between these two? Do you want to draw those two and then get out your protractor? No, I don't think that would do it. Do you want to create a three-dimensional model with straws or toothpicks? Okay, that might do it, but that's going to be very time consuming. No, actually, the dot product tells you the exact value of the angle. And so that's the major superpower of the dot product. So Here's the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. And here's the triangle inequality. Like I say, you watch the video to see them. I'm just gonna state them on this piece of paper. And I could state them in the context of a vector u and a vector v. And right now, again, I'm not drawing two-dimensional vectors. I'm not drawing three-dimensional vectors. I am drawing vectors in any dimension, but I'm just representing them on this two-dimensional sheet of paper. 
Okay. And then you know that this is like a shadow of the vector V. This is the vector V over here too. This is the vector U over here also. And this going across is the vector U plus V. Roshi-Swartz inequality and the triangle inequality are two fundamental facts about this parallelogram that are true in any dimension. And the first is the cauchy schwartz inequality says that if you dot two vectors, u and v, you will never get more. The length of u times the length of v. In fact, you will never get less than the opposite of these. So u dot v is always pinned between mag u times mag v or minus mag u minus mag v. They deal with a minus, people deal with a minus traditionally by putting epsilon. Nine. But if you wanna say it in two inequalities, that's fine too. So this is called the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. It looks like a very underwhelming, like, you know, yawn, yawn. So what? Triangle inequality, at least to you, looks a little more exciting. It says that if you ever take two vectors and add them, the length can never exceed the lengths of the two vectors added. And I said this at the beginning of the session today by saying the shortest distance between two points is a line, right? Here's point P and Q. Is it shorter to go along U and then along V or to go along U plus V? This triangle inequality is saying a guarantee that no matter what vectors you have going along the straight line will always beat, will always be less than going along one than along the other. This is called a triangle inequality. The Pythagorean theorem says, in this special case, where you and V are perpendicular, means U dot V is zero. Then there's an even tighter relationship. Then U plus V becomes the hypotenuse of a right triangle. And that square is equal to one side squared length plus the other side squared length. So this is called the Pythagorean theorem. So the Pythagorean theorem is a special case of what we call the triangle inequality. So what do these things do for me? Like I said, these are truths. They're solid universal truths. They're in any dimension. I demonstrate that on the two videos. But I'm not going to demonstrate here. I'm just going to use it. Well, let's take the cauchy schwartz inequality and look at u dot v divided by mag u mag v. Sorry. Numbering, papers, finite disk space. Moving papers up, they always struggle with that. Well, let's, let's look at this. I'm comparing two things when I make a ratio, right? If the top one's bigger than the bottom one, I get a number bigger than one. But what does the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality say? This top thing, 
is never bigger than the bottom thing. Now remember the absolute value sign there is a shorthand for u dot v is always less than or equal to mag u mag v. And always greater than or equal to minus mag u mag v. Remember absolute value less than something means between, right? So I can take both of these down here. If u dot v is always less than or equal to mag u mag v, then this fraction is always less than or equal to one. I'm trying to get both of these on the screen at the same time, excuse me. And if u dot v is always bigger than or equal to minus mag u mag v, then this thing is all, always bigger than minus one. Now there's another famous animal that what? Always lives between minus one and one. What's the name of that animal? Cosine. Cosine is always bigger than minus one and always less than one. So here's an interesting theory. I have one animal trapped between minus one and one. I have another animal trapped between minus one and one. Are they the same animal? Now, ordinarily, you'd say that's silly. You can't just say that because two things live in the same place, they're the same animal, right? Rhinoceros, cheetah, not the same animal. You know, dog, cat, not the same animal, even if they live in the same house. But here, we're going to use some of our geometry knowledge. And let's talk about the angle between u and v, called theta. Now, this parallelogram here is not a right triangle in any sense, right? Now, by the way, if this is theta, then so is theta over here. And then by ordinary geometry, this must be the supplementary angle, 100 minus theta. But do you have a feeling for this? Do you have a feeling for what you could do with this triangle here? Oh, here comes u minus v. You thought u minus v was just an afterthought of the parallelogram law. But now let me show you a very cool trick. Do you remember in triangles? A, B, C. If it's a right triangle here, C squared is A squared plus B squared. But what if this is not a right triangle? Do you remember another thing that was like almost right triangles? like a compensation for right triangles, it's called the law of cosines. C squared equals A squared plus B squared minus two AB cos theta. This is almost the Pythagorean theorem, but since theta is not 90 degrees, if theta is 90 degrees, sure the cosine is zero, sure I've got the Pythagorean theorem, but if theta is not 90 degrees, then this is like a compensation. This is like an extension of the Pythagorean theorem. This is like the Pythagorean theorem for non-right triangles, if you people allowed us to speak like that. Well, let's look at this drawing up here compared to that drawing. Let's fill in the names of the animals up here. The C length is the magnitude of U minus the magnitude of V squared. The A length is the magnitude of U squared. The B length is the magnitude of V squared. And the minus two AB is minus two. A is mag U, B is mag V. 
and theta is the angle between u and v. Now, my first idea is that, whoa, 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 I've made this much worse. Like, okay, how does this prove that cosine theta is the same as this animal? But now let's take a time out. Let's go over here, time out. And let's think about dot product, sorry, truths. I've run out of room, so I'll say truths, or I could say properties. You know, for example, I already said to you that u dot v is the same as v dot u. And you believe that pretty quickly. In that way, the dot product was like a multiplication, but there's some other properties of the dot product that you could also check pretty quickly. It's also like a multiplication in the distributive law. If you take u dotted with v plus w, you will get the same as if you did u dotted with v plus u dotted with w. Oh, sorry, I'm running out of paper because I slid the paper off the edge. Now, the, the rules that I'm writing down here, the dot product properties, I really slid off the edge there. So uh, sorry for the bad use of space. These rules are also written in your book. So the dot product obeys a distributive law with respect to addition of vectors. It also kind of be, believes or behaves well with respect to scalar multiplication. If I take a number times u dot v, I will get the same number if I had first scaled u and then dotted v, or first scaled v and then dotted u. So in this sense, the dot product is associative. You can move a scalar in and out between the two vectors and you will not damage the dot product. But here's the massive killer property of dot products. Whenever you dot a vector with itself, you get the square of the length of the vector. And we've actually done that already today. I'll pull up the previous paper. What if the vector v is v1, v2, v3? Uh, I'll write it again for emphasis. No, I'm just writing it so I can dot it with itself. Do you see if I dot the vector v with itself, I get v1 squared plus v2 squared plus v3 squared? Or if I did it in two dimensions, I'd only take those two dimensions. But do you see that when I dot a vector with itself, what I get is its length. No, not its length, its length squared. When I dot a vector with itself, I always get the square of the length. Now, let's go back to the statement I have right here. Excuse me, move some papers on my desk. If I dot a vector with itself, I always get the square of the length. So let me interpret this black sentence in that spirit. The magnitude of u squared is u dot u. The magnitude of v squared is v dot v. That doesn't sound very exciting. I'm not going to change these things over here for a moment. How about the magnitude squared of u minus v? Well, according to this rule, 
this is u minus v dotted with u minus v. Okay, that doesn't look very helpful yet. But now let's go to the second property, that I can use a distributive law when I use dot products. I could literally FOIL this out, u dot u minus u dot v minus v dot u. and minus V dotted with minus V, minus times minus must be plus. Why? Because I can take any constants out of a dot product operation. I can factor out the two minus ones, make them positive V dot V. And let me squeeze in the right-hand side, U dot U plus V dot V. Getting tight, but I'll insert minus two mag u mag v cosine theta. But now the magic happens because I have u dot u on both sides cancel. I have v dot v on both sides cancel. And here I have minus u dot v minus v dot u, but you know that u dot v and v dot u are the same. So this is minus two u dot v. But over here I have minus two mag u mag v, excuse me, when I move the paper up, cosine theta. Well, this is getting very simpler, right? Of course, you know, the next thing I'm gonna do is cancel the twos negative, right? And then you see exactly what I'm gonna do next. I'm gonna divide both sides by mag u mag v. And what sounded incredible a second ago turns out to be true. The cosine of theta can always be discovered by taking u dot v over mag u mag v. I think what I'm gonna do if I can find the paper, you remember I thought this angle was 97 between u and v, now we're gonna calculate it. But first of all, I wanna absorb this for a second. Do you realize how silly it was to say, oh, because these two things are between minus one and one, could they be the same? That's a dream, that's a crazy dream. But someone had been here before us and someone had investigated this. And I want you to think about this. This u dot v over mag u mag v, that's strictly an algebra operation. Whereas theta is strictly a geometric animal. I mean, the cosine theta is a reading of the theta, but strictly a geometric angle. So geometric animal, it's an angle. It's the angle in this picture. So what we just did is matched an inherently algebraic object and an inherently geometric object. That is very powerful. That is a very big accomplishment. Now you're gonna say, quite rightly, ah, but you used the law of cosines, Dave. How do I know the law of cosine works in three dimensions? How do I know law of cosine works in four or five dimensions? I only did it in two dimensions in my geometry class. Well, that's the point of these two objects. If you know the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality is true in any dimension, and if you know the triangle quality is true in any dimension, then you get to drag all of your geometry up into the higher dimensions. 
And you will have a law of cosines for three dimensions and more. And you will have a law of sines, etc. All your other geometry knowledge can be transferred appropriately to higher dimensions. So now I have this tool to measure angles exactly. So let's go back and pull up those two vectors. And one vector was one and three, u equals one comma three. We're gonna cut it off here in just a second. And another vector was Oh, I'm sorry, the vector V was four and minus two. And now I'm gonna quickly calculate the angle between them. So I'm, for the sake of time, I would almost not write this down. I'm not gonna write down the calculations. I'm just gonna do the calculations and present them on the paper. U dot V we already discovered was minus six. Mag U is one plus nine rooted, root 10. Mag V is 16 plus four rooted, root 20. So this is root 200. So this is uh, root two times 10. Or if you want to simplify that farther, you cancel out this two right here is a minus three over five root two. Some people argue whether the root two should be on the top or the bottom. I'm not gonna worry about that right now. I'm just going to, by mode, and switch to degrees, just quickly calculate the inverse cosine. That's the cosine of this angle. Let's take the inverse cosine to get the angle, I use degrees, 115.10 degrees. Now, uh, really that's kind of disappointing because I was looking for 97, right? This is 115 degrees. Did I do my protector right? Uh, did I do my calculations right? You know, there's all kinds of things I could screw up here. But now this is definitely bigger than 97. Okay, so what am I faced with? I'm either a really bad measurer or a really, really bad calculator. But let's assume that I could draw something very, very neatly. I think I'm going to bet on that number right there. I think maybe you and I are both going to have to go back and calculate that really carefully and draw it really carefully and measure it really carefully and see what we get. Because it's not nice to come up with two different answers like that. And even this doesn't even look like it gets past 115. Something is bothering me about that number. Two, 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 root 10, 16 plus four is 20. Oh, okay, four minus six, this is negative two. So way back there, nobody stopped me. This was negative two. Okay, now I have negative one fifth root two. So I got to repeat that. See, when something doesn't look right to you, you always got to go find out why. Now I'm talking about 98 degrees, and that looked much more like my reading. Don't just assume you did something right. Don't assume I did something right. You have to check it out. Okay, I did everything I want to do today. We're gonna to have to cut it off. 
but I did not explain to you what direction cosines were because I just got down to cosine. And I did not explain to you what projection was. Now these are presented in the book and I'll let you go to the book and check them out. But I'll give you a quick formula for the projection at a right angle of one vector onto another. When someone says project one vector onto another, they mean cast the shadow of that vector along the line of the second vector. What does the shadow look like? And there's a simple formula for that shadow. Sorry. So the projection of a vector u onto a vector v, again, two or three dimensions, any dimensions, is u dot v divided by v dot v. Those are two numbers divided scalar times v. The awkward looking formula at first till you realize that u only appears once and everything else is v's. So this is the shadow that u casts on v. Some people call it u parallel or u parallel to v. And then the leftover part is called u perp, u perpendicular to v. That's what I get if I take u and I subtract the projection of u onto v. And this idea of breaking a vector down into a parallel and a perpendicular part has got a fancy name. It's called orthogonal decomposition. Okay, I've overstayed my welcome. I'm gonna to have to leave it right there. We'll talk about this again when we come back next week. Orthogonal decomposition is one of the homework problems I want you to perform in the next homework assignment. So it's just a calculation I want you to perform. Okay, I'm gonna clean this up. I'm gonna record it, have the recording posted, and then I will see you again next week. Enjoy your break.